Hi, my name is Michael Drought. I'm a professor of English at Wheaton College. I'm talking about elements of the Lexomics project. There are other videos related to this topic that, that you can see. And in this one, I'm going to talk about a technique uh, or a set of methods, if you'd prefer, called rolling window analysis which, as best I can tell, we actually invented as part of the Lexomics research group. So other methods we use, other people who have done computational stylometry have, have tried. But rolling window analysis is something that we invented, um, I won't say accidentally, I'll say that we invented it because we stumbled upon a problem. And then in trying to fix that problem, we discovered that the, the method of fixing had let us have better information. So that's very abstract, so let me, let me be really specific. In Old English, the earliest form of the English language, uh, in or Old English writing or orthography, we have two sort of interchangeable symbols. And these are called thorn and ev. And they're both used for the sounds that we now use a th sound for, so th and th. And they're, they're interchangeable as far as we can tell. Thorn uh, seems to have come in from Germanic runes, and Ev seems to have come into uh, Anglo-Saxon from Irish manuscripts. It was an Irish D. It was, a, it was a sort of form like that. So Thorn and Ev are a little bit of a problem when we're doing another kind of lexomics research called dendrogram analysis, because uh, this is called hierarchical agglomerative clustering. I'll, I talk about it in a different video. But in that kind of analysis, we count words. So here's the problem. If you have the word this, which is thes, same, same thing in Anglo-Saxon, and you have it spelled with a thorn, and you also have it spelled with an ev, the computer will count them as two different words rather than the same word. But that's just a phenomenon of the spelling. Sometimes spelling is important. In that case, it, it, it's probably not. And so from the very beginning of our work on Anglo-Saxon, we'd worried about that because we wanted to get accurate counts, not you know, half as much because some of them were thorn and some of them were ev. And so what we had developed was a process we called consolidation. And that was simply running a little computer script that took all the eds and turned them into thorns. Therefore, if you had this spelled one way and this spelled the other way, you just had two versions of the word this. It's really simple. And what we found was that consolidation didn't really matter that much in many texts. In other words, if you converted all the thorns to eds and you, but then you produced your dendrogram analysis, your, your cluster analysis, that dendrogram, that tree diagram, was the same shape whether or not you consolidated thorn and ev. And if you think about that, that sort of makes sense in that since you're ca ca calculating distances, uh, meaning like different amounts of things, if you had four thorn thises and four ev thises in one segment and one thorn this and one ev in another segment, that's eight versus two if they're all mixed together. But it's four to one and four to one if they're separated, and that's the same ratio. And so most of the time it doesn't matter, but sometimes it does when there are different scribes, when there are different um, distributions. And this one time when it did matter confused the heck out of us. So my students and I were looking at all the poems that might be by the Anglo-Saxon poet Kinnewulf. Uh, this is a guy who signed his name in his poems by working runes into uh, the, the text of the poems. And there's a bunch of poems that are signed by him. There are four poems that are signed by him. And then there's maybe four or five others that are thought to be by him and might be. And not. we were trying to, to see what we could find out. And we got sort of weird looking dendrograms in, in the sense that when we ran them one day, they had a particular shape. And when we ran them the next day, they were different. And the text can't change. And so we were like, what the heck happened? And finally, we tracked it down to that we were using consolidated dendrograms on the Monday and unconsolidated dendrograms on the Tuesday. But these had not ever made a difference before. And it was only in a couple segments of the text. And finally, my student, um, Ellie Chauvet, who graduated from Wheaton a couple years ago, he and I went through and we're looking at everything. And, and he, he noticed, or I noticed it, wow, it's like all eds in this portion of the poem. And in the rest of the poem, mixed up thorns and eds. What's going on here? And so we tried to figure out sort of like where the eds were. And this sounds like a really easy thing, right? You look through the poem and there's a bunch of eds and thorns, but it's, it's challenging because these are just letters and you have to go through and we were like tabulating things on graph paper and trying to figure it out. 
And what we realized was that if you make like little segments, say every 10 lines, every 20 lines, that is really still very difficult to visualize to, and to see like where is there a concentration of ads. Because one thing if like it's all ads, right? It's another thing if the, the ratio of ads goes from 60-40 to 55-45 to 50-50. That's very hard to see uh, just with looking at a, a lot of words. And so we came up with this idea of using instead of these little segments, uh, making them continuous in some way. And fortunately, I teach a lot of classes, uh, joint classes with mathematicians. So I've heard a lot about intervals and continuous and make the interval smaller, make the, make the interval delta t, you know, the smallest possible uh, interval and so forth. Now that's not perfectly applicable to us because if you make the smallest possible interval, you just have lots of dots and it doesn't make sense. But what popped into my head was this idea of using what's called a rolling average or a continuous moving average. And what that meant was we took say lines 1 to 100 of the poem. Lines 1 to 100, we're going to count up all the thorns, we're going to count up all the eds, we're going to calculate the ratio of thorns to thorns plus eds. So what that gives you is basically any chance that a poet had to use either, or the scribe had, sorry, the poet's the one writing it, the scribe is copying it, any chance that a scribe had to use one of those symbols. So that's why the bottom is, is thorn plus ad. That's how many th sounds there are in that whole hundred lines. Count them all up and calculate that ratio. And then plot it as a point. So we say line one through hundred, we're going to count that as point number one. And we're going to, whatever that ratio is, 0.56 or something, and plot that. Then we move that window from line one to hundred to line two to 101. Do it again. Put the point down. Move it again, do it again, move it again, until you get through the whole text. And to our surprise, what we found out, or what we got as a result, was this graph that looked like a, a cardiogram or a, a stock table of the price of something. It goes up, it goes down, it wiggles around, sometimes it's flat. And that was interesting because for the poems we were looking at, it told us exactly sort of where the concentration of when, you know, suddenly the poem went like, choop, and that's like, that's the part that's messing up our, our dendrograms elsewhere, and that's telling us something. And that's one of the things that I, uh, sort of the more general ideas about lexomics, is that it lets the data speak to you. 